Welcome to a special edition of the Knowledge Institute podcast, where we discuss the global startup ecosystem with experts, deconstruct main ideas, and share their insights. I'm Jeff Cavanaugh, head of the Infosys Knowledge Institute. Today, we're here with John Bohannon, Director of Science at Primer. John, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. John, let's start off talking about your history for a minute. How did you go from getting a PhD in molecular biology from Oxford to becoming an investigative data journalist embedded with NATO in Afghanistan? Um, <laughs> not having a plan is a great is a great way to have that happen. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I've been following a, a little algorithm my whole life of uh, just keep on doing it if it's interesting and satisfying and you feel like you're growing. And if not, start looking for something new. It, it's a surprisingly simple little rule to follow. It sure leads you to some interesting places. But um, more specifically, I, I did a PhD because I thought it would be fun. I didn't have a really specific plan. I really enjoyed it. But then um, I wasn't good enough with my hands. I think uh, with molecular biology, if you're going to work in the lab, you actually have to be quite dexterous. And uh, the thing that drove me crazy was I would squirt a droplet of liquid just into the wrong tube or... <laughs> <laughs> the wrong amount and you would lose sometimes months of work if you're just if you're not good enough with your hands it can it can drive you crazy so i knew i needed to take a break at least and um so after my phd i was looking around for just trying trying to find uh something totally different to do for a year and i don't know how i found out but i i heard that science the journal had um possibilities for interns of some kind and so I sent an email or maybe even a paper letter <laughs> to the editor of science. And I later, I later found out it circulated as a joke uh, at science. Science is like one of the most prestigious journals in the world, you know, science and nature. And um, sometime later, I got an email from the editor of the news department at science. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, you have a very interesting background. I, I told him I was uh, finishing a molecular biology PhD and I hadn't um, written much, but uh, except for plays, I was very active in the theater scene in, in England. And uh, he said, well, the, you know, that's interesting. Maybe you should do a, a news internship. And uh, so then he passed me off to um, Rich Stone who had just started uh, the Cambridge UK Office of Science. And uh, he said, well, have you ever written any journalism? No. Uh, he said, okay, well, here's a scientific paper, write about it. I was like, Okay, um, can you give me some examples of what that looks like? <laughs> and uh, he did, and I just sort of copied the style and he said, all right, kid, good enough. And uh, the next thing I knew, uh, I was on the border of North Korea trying to track down a guy from Germany who had set up a factory to convert dead human bodies into artwork. You may have heard of this big show that's traveling around called Body Worlds. Well, back oh, yeah, then it was, yeah. yep. So my mission was to try and find out whether where he was getting his bodies uh, was and most most importantly, was he sourcing them from Chinese state prisons and mental institutions? The answer was yes. And so I kind of broke that story and uh, there was just no looking back. I loved it. The idea that you could use your scientific know how um, to just go off into the world and investigate, you know, things in the real world um, and then write stories about it. I just loved it. So I did that for uh, more than a decade. The Indiana Jones of journalism. All right. We have a, we <laughs> yeah. have a new hero looting, here. Looting, uh, looting uh, our antiquities as I go. <laughs> wow. That's a whole other, whole other thing we can talk about. But look, let's, let's get yeah. on this. Um, artificial intelligence is a crazy, broad, mm -hmm. rapidly you know, churning, evolving topic. So let's take a cut to the solid object here. You said that um, uh, you had this data background, you get the PhD, so obviously a lot of studying. Well, Primer, as I understand it, is an AI company. What do you do at Primer? Yeah. So one little twist in the plot is uh, in over the past, let's say, seven years, um, I've switched entirely to data science. Even when I was a journalist, I was just entirely doing coding and data science. And um, so when I joined Primer, the first thing I wanted to, to focus on was um, 
how to make sense of scientific papers from the point of view of a machine. So, um, you know, in this case, people interested in science are the customer. They could be actual scientists or they could be policymakers or they could be um, someone um, at a drug company who's trying to get their head around um, the science uh, of something to build a product. Um, and you have, a, you have this fundamental problem of, of too much information. And so I just brought my skills to bear um, from science journalism. I put myself in the customer's shoes and um, I had a wonderful team to work with to try and uh, create new algorithms to process that text in order to help you find stuff. So mm -hmm. like, here's a concrete example. One of the first things that I coded myself was a jargon translator. So the way it works is you feed in text like a scientific paper. And what it does is it goes through and it tries to find technical terminology that is being abbreviated. So um, ML is a great example of that. AI is an example of that. You know, AI, if you keep on using that term, uh, you're going to lose some people because they might not know that it stands for artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, Infosys, I'm not even sure what that stands for. Uh, someone knows. Uh, information systems, maybe. And so that's jargon. Jargon is special technical language that people are using in text. And so the first thing I did was to make something that finds all that stuff, figures out the abbreviated in the long form, and just automatically generates a glossary for you of the jargon. Uh, it's, it's kind of a dumb pet trick <laughs> with data science. Not hard, but man, does it make a difference, you know, because you can now go into a whole new field something you, you know nothing about. And when you hit a term that it just is totally mystifying, you've got this automatic glossary that'll tell you what it stands for at least. Great. Well, we can dive into the alphabet soup of ML, NLP, and NLG, AI, uh, and, and so on. Um, from what we've read in our brief discussion, that seems to be the center of what you do. Could we demystify a little bit uh, and make those terms kind of real world and yeah. what's your thought process behind focusing on machine learning, natural language processing, et cetera? Sure. Yeah. So when I started a primer circa 2017, um, NLP, which is natural language processing, uh, this is the whole, you know, using computers to make sense of text. It, it, it was really hard. I mean, really hard. The tools just were not there yet. You had to, you had to build everything from scratch. Um, and there was a lot of rule-based heuristics. So you would, you would, you know, you'd have to be the machine yourself and figure out the exact step-by-step -step process that uh, some algorithm could do to make sense of that text. So in the case of that algorithm uh, that did the automatic jargon glossary generation, it's nothing but rules. There's no fancy machine learning in there. It's going and looking for patterns. And I, as the engineer, had to figure out what those patterns are one by one find all those corner cases. It's a lot of work. Now, starting in 2018, just a, a year and, and a half later from when I started, suddenly they, um, uh, NLP practitioners had the, had the whole situation change when a new tool got created called language models. And that just suddenly, and I really mean overnight, stuff started working. You could, you could basically solve problems that you would have had to spend weeks and weeks making some really bespoke little, you know, hand crafted solution for. Now you could just throw data at the problem and nine times out of 10, it would just work. And I, I tell you, NLP just got fun. <laughs> My job just turned from, a, you know, a good mixture of fun and hard work to just fun just playground fun. And um, that's, that's where machine learning really shines. Um, and we're in the middle of a real revolution here. So, you know, now if I were to solve that jargon problem again with these new tools, um, I would take a totally different approach. I would just go and have some human experts label data for us, just basically capture what they know, which is essentially capturing what they want. And then I would teach a machine using a machine learning model to just do that task. And the more data you give it, the better and better it gets. Now there's, there's lots of caveats there. You know, it always doesn't work. It doesn't always work as well as you hope. 
Um, sometimes it's not the right tool for the job, but more and more here at Primer, and I think across the industry, we're ripping out all of those old heuristic-based approaches, those hard-coded, bespoke little NLP solutions, ripping them out by the roots and replacing them with machine learning. It's kind of, uh, there, there's this expression that software is eating the world. Well, machine learning is eating software. Interesting, interesting. Just because yeah. it's, it's, it's much more reliable. Got it. Well, taking a step forward, because we could go into that probably for hours itself. Um, with all this advance, uh, you, you're with this company, Primer. And before we dive into this concept of bias and, and, and where it might take us, broadly speaking, what does Primer do and how is it taking advantage of these things? So we can set, set a baseline here. Yeah. I often, I often describe Primer as a company that builds tools for people who have the word analyst somewhere in their job title. You'll find analysts in the government, you'll find them in big banks, you'll find them in uh, big companies like Walmart. And uh, those are our customers. So we, we're an enterprise software company and um, we build systems that allow you to capture what you know as an expert, whatever your world is, whether it's national security or um, it's uh, investment, or maybe it's um, uh, figuring out the supply chain risks of a massive you know, uh, operation. Whatever your world is that you care about and you're responsible for, we try and take your knowledge and encode it into machine learning uh, engines, we call them. And then you can hook up those engines to do useful work for you. And that's the name of the game here. These aren't these aren't like uh, walking, talking AI robots. That's not what we build. That's not our thing. We build something more like farm tools, <laughs> more like factory tools. Um, the building blocks to essentially automate or semi-automate big parts of the working day of people who read and write, analysts. So you might have that pretty visualization tool or some tool on the back end. It's just a whole lot of good horsepower before you get there. That's right. Yeah. Um, really, the, the special sauce at Primer is, is, is mathematical. It's all behind the scenes. Um, but you, you put your finger on something really important there, which is if you, something we've learned, you know, the hard way, um, is no matter how smart you make some system with machine learning, at the end of the day, you need a, a user experience that connects that gap between the machine and the human so that um, you can actually understand it and use it gracefully. So UX, as we call it, user experience, is a huge part of the puzzle here. It's not all just, um, it's not all just you know, machine learning magic. A lot, of, a lot of the hard work you have to do is, is with good design and um, just good, good interaction. Well, if we take uh, as an endpoint, like a North Star, accuracy and trust, let's say, these are so complex, it's hard for anyone to understand it. We don't even know what's going on in our smartphones, <laughs> you know, or around us, uh, really, if you think about it. So trust is such an important aspect of this. I'd like to cover and get your perspective in three areas. Uh, one of them is the actual setup. Like what kind of rules do you have, the assumptions, uh, and then we'll move into maybe the math and finally the UX. It, what's the possibility for introducing inaccuracy, unreliability through bias at each of these three points? I think that's, that's an interesting dimension that helps people either lose trust or gain it depending on you know, how they feel about how that, what they know about it. So let's talk about the sourcing part. Yeah. When you think about this data, how do you choose what data to pull in and what rules to govern its structure? Yep. So that's, that's really at the heart of what makes the difference between a, um, a reliable system that, you know, actually gets used and does good work in the world and doesn't cause trouble. And one that you really regret building, you, know, you really put your finger on it. Um, we have a, we have a company value at primer that we express in two words. We call it always human. And, um, what it means to us is 
all the other values, all the other things that guide your decisions when you work at Primer, it really falls under this top level value of being always human. And that means always caring about outcomes for your customer, for the rest of the world. Um, and I, I think that's just a, a tenet of good engineering. If you put on blinders and you just focus on the narrow little task, uh, building some widget, and you don't care what, you know, what the consequences are or how reliable it'll be in contexts other than the ones that are specified for you, then you're not doing good engineering. You got to care. You got to expand that circle of caring way beyond your little project, way beyond your team, way beyond your company, eventually to the whole world. Um, and so at Primer, we spend a lot of time talking about this. And one of the most important dimensions of this kind of, uh, we call it responsible technology, is bias. And so bias is, is one of the dimensions that you care about, especially when anything involves machine learning. Because machine learning, uh, if you peel open the, uh, the case on this thing, it's all mathematics. It's a statistical model that's trying to uh, make guesses about things. That's actually, <laughs> that's the open secret about ML is it's really just a big guessing machine. And it's surprising how much good work you can get out of a guessing machine. But that brings up the issue of um, are, the, are the dice loaded? So, you know, if you're out uh, in Vegas, and you're, um, you're, you're playing a game of dice, bias means that those dice aren't gonna have an equal chance of coming up with each number. That's, that is essentially the mathematical definition of bias. Now it turns out that all models have bias. Literally, you can't make a, a model without bias uh, unless it's so simple that you know, it's, it's just a toy problem. And most bias is harmless. In fact, a lot of bias is intended you want, you want the system to swerve towards some goal. The bias that we worry about, and we talk a lot about uh, at Primer in terms of how to detect it, how to mitigate it, how to prevent it, is bias that harms people. So <clears throat> an example of a model that would harm people is if you had a model that helped, helped you figure out whom to hire. So if you had a model that essentially was, uh, you've outsourced some of your decision-making about who gets a job, to a model, if that model is biased against some group of people uh, unfairly, that's bias that you don't want. That's bad bias. So the tricky thing is how do you detect bias? How, what do you know to look for in the first place? How do, you, how do you detect it? And then once you've found it, how do you figure out whether you should do anything about it? Uh, it in other words, like what's its potential for harm? And then if you want to do something about it, how do you go about doing that? It's a whole chain of, of work to uh, track down bias in machine learning models. And we've been putting in, putting in a, a bunch of work on that. Well, I was going to break this down into three chunks. You've actually addressed, I think, something longitudinally. It's across all three, source, mm -hmm. the math, you know, the actual churning part, and then the, uh, the output. Is there anything that's different about those three, how you set up, how you actually run the math or stats, and how someone experiences it. You know, for example, you can mislead people through charts and graphs, you know, by, by showing in many ways. In your experience and, and in your company, where do you see, are they, all, are they all equal but different? Or is there one area you really have to look for to make sure that bias doesn't creep in in a harmful way? It's a really good point. Um... You know, what I, what, I, what I heard, what really stuck out to me of what you just said was that you can have things not be biased and still be misleading and cause harm. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually, I just think that's the most important point to make actually before, before we dive any deeper into bias and its math and how to deal with it, which is a topic close to my heart. I think it's important for people to keep in mind that usually much greater harm can come from just misunderstanding a thing that's working as intended. And it's just a break, it's a failure of imagination on the part of the creator of this thing that the user, whoever is in, in experiencing this thing or interacting with this thing, just uh, did not understand your intentions, did not understand what this thing is you know, meant to do, what, it, what, what its strengths and weaknesses are. 
and even if it's unbiased. Um, and I think that's generally true, especially in the world of software, is that bias is one source of potential harm and we got to care about it. And I can, I can tell you why I think it needs a lot of attention um, now more than ever. But we should never forget that you can do a lot of harm just by poorly designing some something at the final mile. You know, it's a perfect machine, but by the way, it's confusing to use. And, you know, you commonly use it wrong. And when you do that, it causes harm. <laughs> that, I think that's actually most of the harm caused by the, the built environment of the world. But Excellent point. And that's one of the, um, I went down the whole Lean Six Sigma master black belt path, you know, years ago and was fascinated by using statistics in a very simple way. And but yeah, you can do some profound things and also prevent bad things. And one of them was the whole pokey, okay, you know, from the Japanese model of error proofing, like literally sticking a tab or something. So you couldn't put it in the wrong way. Hmm. And, and I've always thought about that, 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 so in other words, you can't use it the wrong way. Yeah. Or, or maybe it's, even if it's the ris risk of being redundant, maybe when you explain data, you say, by the way, do not use it in this situation, you know, yeah. for a very narrow application. Yep. It works. As soon as you apply it differently, it's not valid. All uh, bets are off. So, yeah, exactly. So the fact that the, the, the technology works, you, know, you might be pointing it in the wrong direction for the wrong purpose. Anyway. What, what's that Japanese term? Poke yoke. Uh, the, the idea of you just can't use it wrongly. Like often in automotive, you yeah. have a tab sticking out. That if you looked at the part, you would say, why does that gadget or, or, or widget or valve have this little tab sticking out it's because you can't turn it this way it has to go in that way yeah so it's, uh, it's nudging the user to do the right thing exactly it's kind of like in, in software how maybe you highlight a field or you force validation you can't put a zero instead of an o or vice yep. versa that yep. maybe later you get misinformed or you get misclassified you know that's a great term i'd never heard it so it turns out we we have some pokey yoke for machine learning I uh, didn't know what it was called, uh, but it's it's in the works. One of these that's really taking the industry by storm is something called a model card. You can think of it as a baseball card for your for your machine learning mm -hmm. model. It's like, here's everything you need to know. A one-stop shop. Here's what it's good at. Here's what it's bad at. Here's what it was trained on. Here's what its performance looks like on specific test data. It's it's essentially the pokey yoke for uh, machine learning so that uh, when you go and use this, you know, black box model, you know, you can't pretend to know exactly how it works. Um, mm -hmm. You have. You just some... said something too. If I could just, I mean, you just said something. The black box model, and I think yep. there's a concept about black box, white box. That for people outside of the testing world or the coding world, if you can't see inside the box, you are completely relying on trust for anybody to use it. Because I used to be in the supply chain world, you know, big time. And a lot of those optimization tools, late 90s, early 2000s, were solving great problems, integer programming and uh, closed-loop optimization and all that, where, you know, materials and orders and capacity and sequencing were finally put together. No cloud at that point, all on-premise, but nobody would use them in their first wave. And there were a couple of companies like I2 Technologies that said, you know, if we do a very good way of showing what's going on and making it clear and giving a little, little peek inside the box, then the senior executive will say, okay, I trusted enough. And then they just took off. So it wasn't the person that had the best algorithm. It was the one that generated the most trust about a pretty mediocre algorithm at the time sure. that, that it took off. We, so here's a, a direct parallel of that in my world. You're right that a deep learning machine learning model is a black box, ultimately. You, mm -hmm. you just can't hope to know why are the neurons, you know, hooked up this way? We're never going to know. Uh, that's just not how you can understand them. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is you can shine some light into that black box. And one of the tools we've made recently to do that is something called saliency. And so our black boxes, uh, they take input uh, as text, right? So you feed in, you know, pages and pages of text, and it's going to do something for you. Um, for example, it might classify them. Let's say you have a whole bunch of documents flowing in. Um, I'll make this up. Uh, these are uh, complaints from customers. From some system, you've got complaints from customers coming in and you need to triage. You need to put these guys in the right buckets so that they can be dealt with appropriately. Well, you can put a, a classifier right there at that gate and 
the documents are coming in and its job is to say which bucket this belongs in. So that's classification. Um, if that's all you got, that's a classic black box. So you just don't know why I put that doc into that, bo into that bucket. Um, mm -hmm. There's no way to know. And so we've made this thing that you can, you can use to have the model explain itself. So a doc comes in, it says this belongs in bu bucket A. You can say, what was it about this doc that made you decide it belonged to bucket A? And what it does, and it, it literally looks like this, it's as if it took a highlighter pen, went to that doc and said, these words, and in fact, this sentence is the most important bit for me, for me making that decision. And um, it, it just works. It's kind of amazing. Uh, essentially, like when you get human experts to look at um, what the model highlighted, um, they, they sure enough will tell you, yeah, that's how, that's what I would have highlighted. And it's, it's because it doesn't always work that way, but when it does, that really helps. And it's, it's showing you what was most salient when it read the doc. Um, you know, it's interesting, th this what idea you've done of... is you've essentially taken a, a whole big mm -hmm. doc, which takes a long time for a human to read. And then you've, you've focused in on a small part of the doc, which was most useful for its classification effort. And so you've essentially summarized the decision-making process. Yes, and what, what's so intriguing about that is uh, the idea of it's the it's the power of anecdotes, not randomly picked, and not necessarily dumbed down to summarize with simply numbers like forty five hundred uh, neurons or data points was the threshold, and it was forty five oh one, therefore it went to this. No, you picked out something that was common sense, and I think it's the power of the qualitative in conjunction with the quantitative. And people can relate to that. And if they trust the one and see its relevance, they trust the many. Yeah. By the way, it's useful not only for building trust with a customer who wants to use this thing, but it's it's just a great reliability tool for the engineers who build them. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you an example, if I if I train a model and I use saliency, I look at some decisions the model made that I disagree with, and I'm like, why is it why is it making this error? Well, now I can say, show me what it is in this doc that you're paying attention to. And often, if it's if it's a really dumb mistake, it's because, oh, I am picking out these words and these words just look a lot like, and often they will be ambiguous words, or maybe mm -hmm. it'll be, oh, you know what I'm realizing is I've skewed the training data. I've just, in, I've basically taught the model to cheat. You know, uh, whenever it sees this word, it just assumes, oh, that belongs in that bucket. And it's because my, my data isn't balanced. It's not diverse enough. And so these little t these little tools are actually very useful for the engineer as well as the customer. So it all what goes around comes around. All right. So we've talked about bias inside and ways to to, to look at it and to uh, to minimize it. Um, natural language processing is difficult. You said it's gotten better, at least with the horsepower behind it. Mm. You sound like you operate at a global scale, national security, global corporation. What's mm -hmm. the difference about solving? problems at that scale versus something that's a little more of a, you know, small or almost at a toy level. A whole bunch of things, but one, one comes right to mind, which is if, if we're talking about a global scale and that means not just volume, not just like, Oh, there's more of it, but it's more diverse. You know, the, the context in which the thing is going to be used is less predictable, less well-defined. Um, the diversity of, in our case, text, uh, you should assume it's going to be very high. You just don't know. Um, that presents some challenges that you don't have to worry about as much when you have a small scale problem where you really can define all of the, the range of inputs it'll see in the range of contexts and use cases. Um, here's, a, here's a very tangible, practical example of that. We have a, we have a, um, a model called named entity recognition. So it does the job of finding all the people, places, organizations, and other named entity things in a piece of text. So you could feed in a, a contract or a news article or a bunch of emails, and it's just gonna go through um, and find for you all of, the, all of the named entities in that text. And there's a ton of downstream useful work you can do with that. You gotta create that structure first though. 
you know, make, make a big lookup table of all the people, places, things. If you have a, a truly global customer who's going to be building solutions on top of that model, it's a real problem if that model was only trained on Western names. You know, uh, if, if, if it largely only ever saw during training time, Western people, Western locations, Western organizations, um, you can bet it is going to perform more poorly when that model and the systems built on it are deployed off in totally different contexts that involve foreign names, non-Western uh, locations and so forth. And so what we've done at Primer is we've tested how well our named entity recognition model performs um, when you throw it into a foreign land. And the way we did that was we made a huge data set of non-Western and Western names, first and last of people, and we played a substitution game. So we had all this gold label data where we know what the true answers are. And we basically substituted the names of people in our first experiment with one of about a dozen other languages. So we had a big grab bag of Finnish names. We had a big grab bag of Korean names we had a, and so forth. And um, it's, it's a statistical test of whether when you replace the names systematically and randomly uh, with other cultures, does the system perform better or worse in a way that can be explained just by the, the origin language? And sure enough, some models, um, uh, as soon as you swap those names out with anything but other English names, um, the performance just starts to nosedive. It can't recognize the name or it misclassifies it. Oh, that's not a person, that's an organization or whatever. And um, uh, then the next step, of course, is to mitigate. So now what you can do, of course, is you could take training data and play the swaparoo game. So you just make sure that the model really does get exposed to truly diverse names. Now, you, that, it doesn't stop there. You also need to, you need to go and increase the diversity of the text that it was trained on in the first place. You need to go off and you need to find um, you know, foreign newspapers and um, unusual formatted data. You need to boost that diversity so that um, you know, you're not making something that can only run on rails. You really need something that can off-road. Um, but that's what it looks like day to day. That's, that's actually when you're dealing with a truly global set of customers, you, you have to double down on reliability. Well, we are talked uh, about a lot of the basis of bias. I'd like to converge a little bit about what to do about it. Yeah. And assuming that many of the people listening and watching are not government officials or not only in the largest of large companies, mm -hmm. but maybe somewhere in between. Or yep. maybe they don't have the resources, even if they are a large company yet, to do things on a global basis. What about for that medium size or that, that, that group that's experimenting? They're starting to, to work with this now. Yeah. What is something someone can do to get going and see some value maybe in a more of a point solution or a narrowly defined problem and then grow from there? Yeah. Oh, it's um, there's one move you should make. If you're going to just make one move, this one's the one just go measure, just go measure. Whatever it is that you're working on, whatever it is that actually has impact for your customers or within your organization, just go measure it. Um, that's, that's surprisingly few people do it. Even when they have the resources to do it, they just, for whatever reason, they don't measure it. So, you know, let's say that your, your world is, uh, um, some set of consumer facing products and you've got um, you know, some kind of data stream from your customers, go ahead and do some, do some statistics on it. Just see, see if there's a story to tell there. If you've got, if you've got um, some kind of, let's say your, your problem is hiring, go ahead and really measure whatever it is you care about, diversity, geographic location, just measure it. That's the first step. Before you can even mitigate something, you got to know if you have a problem to solve. Right, right. And is there any kind of tool besides going to, to Primer 
that someone might be able to use to get started to do something on a small scale before they work up to your, you know, industrial strength horsepower? Are you talking about NLP specifically? Uh, it could be NLP. You know, is there some way of using a common spreadsheet in a way that in a very small, again, educational basis, or, or is there some open source uh, hmm. or, or for NLP, is there something specific somebody can get going on before, you know, working with a company like yours? You know what? Um, I understand that we're going to be sharing a bunch of links with the viewers. Mm -hmm. um, after this, how about I go off and do some homework for you? And I'll see what I can scare up. That sounds great because I'm excited, very excited about what you're doing and the potential for it and what you're already doing. What I found in talking with clients and people out, uh, that are trying to get going, it's almost like it's a bridge too far. And that's mm. the wonderful thing about an Excel or a Google Docs or Sheets or something, even if it's very small, yep. just to understand concepts. And then there's usually some kind of middle ground where you're solving a problem that still you can get your arms around. And then you take that plunge. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times a company like yours, it's solving it at this grand scale. And rather than, it's almost like even if you gave it away for free, they something that doesn't have so many levers and so big so yeah, they can yeah. get it and then they can kind of graduate and evolve to really make use of what you have to offer. That yeah, kind I call of that thing. the cold start problem. You're right. A lot, everyone has a cold start problem right now. You're right. It, they think it's digital binary. It's I'm either off or I'm doing what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize like you, you went through this whole journey. Yeah. And every once in a while there was a light bulb moment, but it's because you continued it. You, you, lots of iterations. And I think people uh, could really use that guidance, even even understanding which bias is good and which not, because they mm. could be scared into not wanting to do something or thinking they have to cover every possible bias. Otherwise, they're not doing their job. Yeah. And you could say, no, 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 there, there might be 100 things you could do just one after the other. Begin your journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me let me go do some homework for you. That sounds good. Well, as we start to converge a little bit. Uh, what are some of the other kinds of challenges that you're looking to solve at Primer that you see, you know, now and you see around the corner? Hmm. Well, I'd say the thing that's just totally preoccupying me right now is uh, we've launched this exciting new kind of scary, uh, hard to hard to imagine product called Automate. And uh, the the basic idea behind it is we've been building all these machine learning models behind the scenes to power the products that we sell to these big organizations. And um, a, kind of a light bulb went off in our head. Hey, we could also just sell those models and make it possible for people to fine tune them for their own problems. So we have this brand new launched thing called automate and um, it's, it's really incredibly challenging because we have to reverse our engineer ourselves as data scientists so that some customer who's not a data scientist at all can just walk right in and get to work and actually solve a problem like end to end train a machine learning model and deploy it to solve some problem that they have. And it's uh, whew, every step of the way is um, uh, basically barking your shin on a new piece of furniture in the dark realizing, oh, I, I kind of didn't realize how much work I was doing myself tacitly to get this step of the job done. And we need to figure out how to automate that and have a beautiful design so that you don't have to worry about it. You know, um, what's that Japanese term again? Poke yoke. Yeah. We need, we need all, we need a lot of that so that you, you don't have to even think it's just sort of uh, design affordances that just kind of let you flow through this process. It's, it's a grand challenge, you know, the, the, the creation of a machine that lets you do science without having to be a scientist. Um, it's, it's cool. It's a really hard challenge. So stuff that preoccupies me right now, for example, is how do we make a system that lets you um, define... Oh, we got we to gotta let Arpita know that she's unmuted. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> no worries. What is your biggest challenge you're, you're thinking about now? So the problem we're trying to solve uh, right now is 
trying to make it possible for someone to just start labeling data. You know, let's say that you wanted to make that um, that machine learning model that's going to do that job of taking those customer complaints that are flowing in and putting them in the right buckets. So that's, let's say that that's the piece of your knowledge that you want to capture and train a machine to do so that you can do more interesting things. Mm -hmm. um, you need to go in and you need to start labeling data. Well, here's an example of a customer uh, complaint that belongs in bucket B. And here's one that belongs in C. It sounds easy. Sounds like all you got to do is just kind of label some examples and then the system is off and away. But it turns out that it's really tricky to get a good mixture of what we call true positives and true negatives for each of the classes. This is like bread and butter machine learning problems that we know how to deal with as data scientists. Um, what we don't realize is we're doing a bunch of gymnastics when we, when we solve this problem, doing backflips and pirouettes in order to make sure that the data mix is really good for the model to efficiently learn the task. Um, the, the dimensions we care about are diversity, uh, balance, and challenge. So you got to have those three properties. How the heck are we going to make a system, you know, with the right pokeyoke that just guides you into, into finding those examples and labeling them in such a way that you, you get a truly diverse, challenging, balanced data set. It is so tricky. Um, yeah, we're, we're just in the middle of, of doing that right now. I, I feel like we're reverse engineering ourselves. How do we teach a machine to do what we do at Primer to build machines? <laughs> That's the essence of scale, isn't it? Building a machine to build a machine. Yep. Well, that's fascinating. And looking at the corporate world today, are there any specific challenges that you think should be solved? And maybe that's around the corner, you know, beyond the tools that you have today that maybe businesses in general should be solving or you're excited about helping them solve maybe the next year or two? Yeah. Hmm. Gosh. I have so much sympathy for, for everyone who reads and writes all day. Um, you know, having spent a number of years now at Primer building tools to help such people, um, it just makes me appreciate more and more how, how much drudgery there is that holds people back from being creative. You know, these big organizations, all of, you know, governments and banks and giant companies, they have, they have these wonderful people who are super expensive, by the way, um, who are domain experts, um, who spend their whole day reading and writing in order to power really important mission critical decisions. That's what I think of as the, the basic function of someone who's an analyst of some one kind or another. You are the essential gatekeeper of information that powers some crucial decision. And if you get it wrong, then the whole organization is making the wrong decisions and it's an existential threat. So you, these are really important people. And yet, they spend most of their day doing what people in that position did 50 years ago. You're just reading and writing. It's like, we haven't, we haven't progressed. Everyone else has gotten all these wonderful tools. Look at what happened to accountants, you know, over the past 50 years compared to an analyst. Um, you're still just like reading and writing. And I think that's the, that's the next big frontier for automation. Yeah, I, I view what you're doing as on the one hand, you're giving them an Iron Man suit. And the also, it's like uh, Keno Reeves, Neo in the Matrix, where he sits in the chair and I know judo, you know, it's all of a sudden, you, all those constraints are pulled away because you've given them the results of all that drudgery. That's they can the then apply outcome. their, yeah. That's the dream outcome. When, when, when these systems work beautifully, it's just like that. Um, the reality of course, is it's a distribution. You got a long tail of yeah, it's starting to get there. It's useful. It's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And we really want to move stuff from that tail into that Iron Man side of the distribution where it's like, yep, this is a beautifully solved problem. Um, but just to be concrete, an example of something that um, I would love to see us solve in the next couple of years is just keeping track of everything you already know in a knowledge base so that you don't have to basically keep updating this knowledge base. It's a, it should be a self-updating knowledge base 
So you have some system that's listening to you, listening to your world, whatever those information streams are that are passing through. And it just does this passive, boring job of keeping track of everything you're learning about the things you care about in your world. So we call that, that final system a knowledge base or a knowledge graph. It's really just a big database mm -hmm. that's keeping, you know, in a nice structured way, everything you know about your world that you care about. And to this day, people have to do this terrible task that is often called wikinoming. It's that incredibly boring, tedious thing of going and entering data into a system, you know, bit by bit, correcting it, tidying it, adding, feeding it. It's like having a pet. Um, and it just soaks up the, the life force of all these wonderful people who should be freed from that task so they can be synthetic and creative. That's what humans are good at. And uh, we started to build such a system. We call it Quicksilver. We built the first version um, more than two years ago. And um, you can share with readers a nice link to a Wired article that was written about it. Um, there, for our first prototype application, we wanted to make literally a self-writing Wikipedia that would go off and find all of the women of science who were missing from Wikipedia, who had done work just as important and notable as the men of science who already have Wikipedia pages. And it would just write a draft of that person's bio and put it in a queue of work for human volunteers. And so that's what we built. And that's, that's really, that's a sign of what I hope that we're gonna build for the rest of the world uh, in the coming years. So whether you're in the government or a big company, you have some world you care about, whatever it is. And you have all of this information about the entities in that world, whatever that is. And you have to keep it somewhere and you have to somehow get the world's information into your world so that you can access it, manipulate it. You can, you can be alerted when something crucial is changing. And that's the name of the game, self-updating, self-writing knowledge bases. So that's what I want to build. Self-update, self-writing. Yep. Great. Well, respecting your time, we're going to bring things to a close here. What resources do you recommend for someone that wants to learn more about some of the topics we discussed? Ooh, uh, let's, let's pull together some links and, and put them on the page. Um, mm -hmm. I can think of several great introductory um, blog posts that are nice and digestible, won't take much time, very friendly, mm -hmm. and maybe a YouTube link or two um, as a great warm start. Um, that sounds great. And uh, everyone, you'll be able to find details uh, on our show notes and transcripts at emphasis.com slash IKI. And we'll have all the uh, links uh, and resources that uh, just been talking about. Great. Well, yeah. and also, Don, thank you. I, I would mm -hmm. encourage anyone. I would encourage anyone who's hearing this uh, to just uh, go get on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter already, it's not such a scary place after all. I thought it was, and I, I jumped on pretty recently and I actually found it really kind of friendly as long as you, uh, you know, talk to the right people um, and just uh, say hello to me and introduce me to new topics. So on Twitter, I'm Bohannon bot. I'll, we'll put it on the page so people can find it. Um, but yeah, it's, you'd be surprised how, how quiet people are on Twitter. I thought it would be this place that's just so noisy. You don't want to spend a minute there. Actually, you can, you can say hello to someone. And I find that nine times out of 10, they say hello back. You can talk about some amazing things. Depends which door you open, right? <laughs> indeed. Indeed. All right. And steer clear politics. Amen. Amen. Well, John, thank you so much for your time and a very interesting discussion. And maybe we'll have you back again sometime. Oh, it'd be a pleasure. Oh. Everyone, you've been listening to the Knowledge Institute, where we talk with experts on business trends, deconstruct main ideas, and share their insights. Thanks to our producer, Catherine Burdett, Christine Calhoun, and the entire Knowledge Institute team. Until next time, keep learning, keep sharing. <laughs>